there today um, you've I, you got to see the witness blanket earlier and it was such a powerful experience um, and I'm sure for all of you uh, that went walked in with an open mind and an open heart because the the mere emotion that came with all of the pieces of that blanket uh, the history the untold stories the told stories these are the things that we have an opportunity to witness to bear with witness to be a part of. The language that I spoke in when I started is Onyo Da'aga. And there are less than 40 people left on, in the world that speak it. As a result of residential schools, my people are losing their language and we are now critically endangered until, until now. A couple of years ago, I went fasting and I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in my mother's house, and there was a ravine that went down, and then there was this water that went st like a snake through the valley. And there was these people walking along it. And I yelled out to them. I said, hey, where are you going? And uh, they looked back, and it was my elders. And they were telling me that they were leaving. It was time for them to go. And it was a sad dream, because I remember starting to cry, and I actually woke up crying with tears, because it's not just a language. It's not just another form of communication. That language embodies the spirit and the soul and the history and the heritage of my people. It is the way that we give thanks. It is the way that we believe that the world is being held together today. That if we don't sing and we don't dance and we don't feast, that the world would fall apart. That's the way that our people believed it. And I'm so glad that this past year we just concluded an eight month Dwadadi Oneida Language Revitalization. And there are 12 young adults now speaking conversational Oneida every day. And we put in another application to Heritage Canada and we're looking at a year or two. So there are some amazing things that are happening in our communities. Amazing things that are changing, changing the history as we know it. I was talking to a couple of ladies upstairs and we were talking about the witness blanket and we were talking about all these things, about what reconciliation really is. And I was telling them about how I went up north to facilitate a, um, facilitate a meeting amongst health professionals up in the Barry area. And out of the 100 people that were there, 75 of them were mainstream health organizations and 25 of them were native organizations and they split them in two. And they said, Luke, you work with the mainstream organization. So I had 75 people in my group. And I had a list of questions I had to ask. But I went off script and I said, okay, how many of you are here because you truly believe that you wanna make a difference in indigenous health? They all put their hand up, every one of them, 75 people. I said, how many of you have had an indigenous person over to lunch in the last four weeks? About three or four. If we are to move ahead in reconciliation, it means that we have to start to break bread with one another. It means that we must start having dinner together and talking about our children together. It means that we must, have, uh, we must meet somewhere to have those conversations, sometimes the uncomfortable ones. But we must, we must have shared memories and good ones. We must make them. If we are to move past the dark chapter in our history, then we must make new memories. Memories of a shared future, of one that means that we work together, that we play together, that we build a country together. So that is what reconciliation means. It's not a fleeting feeling. It's not a thought. And, I'll, and although I appreciate you coming to be here, it's not even just sitting in this room. It's about going the extra mile. It's about going the distance and being a part of history. That we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to change things and we will.
I thank you all for being here tonight, and certainly on behalf of the London Community Foundation and on behalf of the Museum London, we appreciate you coming to listen to what we think to be a very inspiring conversation uh, with Dr. Jerry White. Uh, but before we do that, I would really, I'd like to introduce um, the lady that helped make all of this happen, Ms. Martha Powell from the Com London Community Foundation. Well, good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you that were upstairs enjoyed um, seeing the witness blanket and hearing a, an explanation of, of it. It's very um, more, much more to learn, so I encourage you to go onto the website. Um, I'm Martha Powell. I'm the president and CEO of London Community Foundation. Um, and in honor of Canada's 150th birthday, and more importantly, to remember the people before us, their heritage and their legacy, London Community Foundation has brought the witness blanket to our community. We celebrate, this year we celebrate not only 150 years of our heritage, but more than 150 years we honor the history of the Indigenous peoples. The witness blanket is a reminder of our country's colonial past, a symbol of reconciliation and inspiration for how we should move forward as a nation. Thanks to the support of our donors through Canada's 150th Fund, we were able to bring the, this important national monument to our community. On behalf of the Foundation, I would also like to thank our partner, Museum London, for hosting the Witness Blanket during its time in London. Because not many Canadians know where the residential school, or knew, know about the residential school era, we believe this is one way we can play a role in helping spread awareness of the atrocities that occurred in communities across our, our country. By educating ourselves like we are today, we can pay, pay tribute and honour to all those who were affected by the residential school system. So what we ask of you tonight is simply bear witness. Be a witness. Before we can move forward with reconciliation, we need education and understanding. The witness blanket is but one way for us to do this. So I challenge you today, be a witness, take a moment to remember the atrocities of Canada's residential school era, and think of how you can be part of the ongoing process of reconciliation, very much as we've just heard. Just a reminder that this, um, this series we're having tonight, there's two more series, uh, next Thursday night and the following Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, there is a poster out there that tells you what they are, so I hope you'll join us again and bring your friends and family. This is just the beginning of the Witness Blankets time in London, so I encourage you to come back and take time. I think um, the, the exhibit upstairs, the installation, does need time to, to really um, walk through and, and think about. It will be on display here in London until July 9th, and then it will be continue on its journey across the country, um, I believe to be permanently housed in Winnipeg. We are proud to be hosting the Witness Blanket here in our community and hope to create awareness and about the history of the residential school era and spark critical conversations around this issue. Miigwech. So please help me in welcoming our uh, feature presentation tonight. Uh, Dr. Jerry White, professor at, at the Department of Sociology at Western University. Jerry is currently uh, the professor and director of the Aboriginal Policy Research Consortium, international and editor-in-chief of the International Indigenous Policy Journal. As a professor and former chair of the Department of Sociology, has held many posts at Western University, including acting director of First Nation Studies, senior advisor to the president and the Senate at Western. Jerry uh, currently serves and the Western's Board of Governors sits as the president of the board for the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. Over his career, he has served on many public inquiries and provincial boards, including being the founding co-chair of the Ontario Health Professions Regulatory Advisory Council. Dr. White has won numerous uh, teaching awards, including the Pelva Pro uh, Professorship, and has authored and co-authored and, and or edited 22 different books. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jerry White. Buzo, uh, Sego, Megwich for coming to this uh, talk tonight. It's a very important year uh, 
in Canada. It's a very important time in terms of truth and reconciliation. So it's wonderful to see, uh, to see all of you. Uh, Luke, thank you for coming. Um, I've known of you for a long time, and uh, you cut a wide swath. As I'm from the prairies, and we say you cut a wide swath through the grass, and that's a compliment. Luke is, uh, is a very active person trying to build, uh, uh, build our communities, working in uh, nonprofits and uh, service organizations, and I thank you for all your hard work, and thank you for being so kind as to introduce me. Um, my name is Jerry White, and I'm a sociologist. That means that we study uh, collectivities, not individuals, and try and understand uh, what life means for them, uh, how things work for, uh, for different peoples. But I promise I'm not studying you right now. Um, I do want to say, though, uh, I've been working for the last 20 years trying to learn more about uh, indigenous peoples around the world, and particularly in Canada. And when I say learn about, I mean learn from. Because the way, and, and I think Luke put it absolutely wonderfully, if we break bread, if we try and understand each other's customs, languages, try to understand our, our ceremonies, our different ways of looking at the world, if we do that, that is the march forward that's going to make a difference in the world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight in more, in more depth. Um, in this, um, I want to be very clear, though. I do not speak for anybody. I speak only for myself and my understanding that I've gathered. Maybe my research center and people who work for me, they have to say they agree with me. But um, I would never, ever try to say that I speak for any indigenous peoples. That would be wrong. And uh, it's not something that I'm uh, ever going to do. In this 150th year, in Canada, uh, we have a very big responsibility. And that responsibility, in terms of what we're approaching tonight, is not only to celebrate our 150 years, because I've had a lot of friends, Indigenous friends, who've said, you know, uh, whether it's Roberta Jameson, whether it's Al Day, say to me, you know, Jerry, the celebration of sesquicentennial is different for us than it is for you. And that's a place to start, to understand why there would be that different kind of understanding. And we'll talk a little bit about what's happened in the country uh, uh, in the past up to the present. And we'll be able to understand a little bit about what that difference is. I always start uh, a talk by grounding myself, uh, remembering who I am and where I am. Um, I'm the great grandson of a newcomer, of an immigrant. My great grandfather left Ireland in 1851. He was 15 years old. He traveled alone to this country. And what he found when he got here, when he dropped off the coffin ships, as we call them in the family, he found a territory, a land that had been cared for and used and loved by the indigenous people who lived here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And because of that care and because he was able to come here, my family, my grandsons, my life has been an incredibly positive thing. And so it's important for us to understand that the real peoples who were um, indigenous to this land, the original peoples, are the peoples that we have to understand took care of this territory for us. And we still live in traditional lands and territories. And I'd like to say that. Um, the, the traditional territories and home currently of the Lenape, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and just before them, the Atawandran peoples. And we're talking about amazing communities near us, Oneida, uh, Chippewa on the Thames, uh, Muncie, and others. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories that we are meeting on today. I'm going to touch on a few things that I've learned and in the process try and answer some questions. The thing about being well over 65 is you have a little bit of territory that you can walk in and you can sort of say I've learned from, from the past somewhat. So there's certain questions that in every meeting all across the last couple of decades people ask. And I'll try and weave some of the answers that I have for those questions. And then if I don't touch on something that's very important to you, please feel free. Um, 
to, uh, to ask me after I'm finished, or you can erupt, in, interrupt me. Um, you know, the two-hand waving usually works, although my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. Um, about 1.4 million people in Canada claim Aboriginal uh, identity, and most Canadians know very, very little about our neighbours. One of the most interesting things is Aboriginal Canadians have achieved amazing successes in almost every field. They've been world leaders in terms of their expertise and what they've brought to this world and this country. Take, for example, Daphne Ojig. Um, I am proud to say she was a friend of mine. She passed in 2016. Um, she was a very gracious person. She actually gave artwork for 13 books that I did. But Daphne was considered by Picasso to be his most talented protege. I don't think that there's probably anyone in the room that knew that. These are things that we have to understand that we don't know our neighbors. Doug Cardinal, amazing, amazing architect. Uh, Doug designed some of the uh, 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 world's most unique buildings, including Museum of Civilization in Canada, I think which was renamed, but I don't remember the new name, the Indigenous Cultural Center in PEMI, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, and dozens and dozens of other, of other buildings. Authors, politicians, sports scientists, lawyers, amazing leaders in every field. And that said, we have to come to know the contributions of our neighbors and build our friendships based on understanding those talents. So first things first, a question. Who are the indigenous or aboriginal peoples and where did they come from? Now this is a very complicated question. Um, first I want to say that we often talk about indigenous peoples, aboriginal people. It doesn't make any sense because there are so many nations with so many distinct cultures and so many distinct languages. It's just as complex as if we look at Europe. We would never say and think about Europeans. We would think about Germans and French and all the different histories and things that they did. We have to understand that indigenous Canadians or indigenous peoples in Canadian territories are just as complex. And we have to come to know it. Now, what we have done, interestingly, is we created these three big groups. The First Nations, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit about territories, the Inuit, and the Métis. By the way, some people ask me, what names can you use? Well, you can ask people what names they want to be called by. I'm from the prairies, so the word native is just ubiquitous. Everybody, you know, my friends who are Métis call themselves native, and other, other people call themselves natives. Indian is dated, and it never was really very good because it's sort of a misnomer because they've, some of the first explorers thought that they had come to India, so that's why they called people Indians, but uh, it's used by some people. Indigenous is the most politically correct, um, and in Canada, legally, Aboriginal is, uh, is what our Constitution talks about. You can decide, but any names that lump people in great groups and treats them as homogenous is essentially wrong. So, what's the difference? Let's just take a little bit. It was so hard to find a map of where people were. Now, this one is one of the least offensive of the maps that exist. But, First Nations people uh, occupy most of the United States and all the way up into northern Canada along the Northwest Territories. And essentially, in the Canadian Territories, we'd say they live between the US border and the northeastern edge of the Northwest Territories. Inuit are mostly north and east of that. And the Métis, and well, and when we're talking about those first peoples, uh, and, and uh, original peoples. There's about 640 communities, give or take, in Canada. Métis are the offspring of contact, originally French, Scottish, and First Nation, and now there's a real wide mix of people. And although, um, and the largest populations of Métis are in the prairies uh, around Winnipeg and in central Alberta. Identity is a huge question, and you've heard about it in the press. You know, there's lots of discussions about cu uh, cultural appropriation. Some, some writers have been called out for overemphasizing some of their Aboriginal backgrounds, let's say. But the identity issue, while it's big, of who is and who is not, 
That's for indigenous people to solve and work on. That is there, uh, that is there for them to determine, not me or the government. So all I can do is do this wide swath. The question, the next question is even more complex. It's um, where did First Nations people or indigenous people come here? Were they always here? Now, first of all, um, it's important to realize that there is different opinions on this question. Traditional peoples, what some people might call religious peoples or ceremonial peoples or people who hold to the old, to the teachings, say the creator created the sun, the moon, the water, the earths, and then created the indigenous people and they've always been here since the creator put them here. To me, that's a faith issue and it's to be respected. We all know that there is also other ways of understanding, and that's a traditional knowledge way of understanding. There's other ways of understanding, and the Western science argues um, that there could be another explanation. To Western science, there's essentially two theories that still hold any water at all. A land bridge from Siberia after the last ice age, about 13,000 years ago, and by boat to the west coast of North America about the same time. The only thing we really know, though, to be really honest, is that the present indigenous populations are genetically related to peoples of Asia, particularly Siberia and other Asian populations. And we found footprints 13,000 years old. That's the picture in the corner. Sorry, it's not clear for you. Um, I led a delegation of Athabasca Athabascan First Nations to uh, meet with Siberian indigenous groups. And what was amazing at this meeting in Siberia was that the peoples, when they got together, they began to share stories. And they found they had a lot of stories that were really, really common. And so whether or not this is the route where North America was populated, it is the case that indigenous peoples do share things worldwide. So where? Do people, yes? What about the recent uh, discovery, I don't know if it's a hoax or not, but the recent, I was reading somewhere, the recent discovery of a man uh, dated to 130,000 years ago that was killed by people, and mammoth was found in North America. Absolutely true, and that's why I say the only thing we know as of today, and that, that's still being analyzed right now, and if that, if that becomes true, then all the theories that we have about this land bridge and everything are just absolute Wrong, right? And so we're still at the point, I think that uh, what I would say now is that we're at the point where what we have to do is have a completely open mind, hold and listen to and try and understand indigenous knowledge ways of understanding these things and keep pressing on our uh, other Western ways of understanding to see if we can't sort that question out. But the one question, Luke, that really is critical is that it's the their indigenous peoples are the original peoples and the people who live and call themselves and, and adopt uh, Aboriginal identities now are the descendants of the original peoples. And if that happened to be 13,000 or 100,000, that's the question to sort out. But your point's absolutely correct. Where do people live? Some regions, the interesting thing about Canada is that some regions have very uh, large populations in a percentage sense of indigenous peoples, and some regions have a large number of indigenous peoples, but it's a small percentage of the population. And this comes to a point that Luke was making in his introduction. If we're gonna talk about breaking bread, we have to reach out, particularly in our own territory of Ontario here, because there's a lot of people spend their whole lives and never really connect with, uh, with our neighbors. Why don't I get to one of the more complicated questions? And that is, and I'm just gonna ask it straight out, um, and it's asked in many different ways. Was the settlement by Europeans a positive thing uh, for indigenous peoples of Canada or not? Good guess, but let me build the story. It's both the easiest and the toughest question. For those of you who are in my age group, you'll remember uh, maybe watching something called Dragnet on Fridays. And um, Joe Friday used to say, um, the facts, 
the facts, ma'am, just give me the facts. And so why don't we look at some sets of facts of what happened and we can come to some conclusions. The first thing is, of course, that Canada is a settler colony. And that means that uh, European uh, influences here came from away. Native people here were long, uh, were long here before anybody from Europe even thought about North America. Now, given time, I'm going to look at three questions. I'm going to look at population, I'm going to look at land, and I'm going to look at residential schools. And I think we should be able to come to some fairly clear understandings of how things worked in the past by doing that. Conservative estimates say, and I'm talking about the most conservative estimates, say that there was about 600,000 uh, indigenous peoples living in the Canadian territories, or what's Canada now, when first contact took place. I believe that's incredibly underestimated. Our research centers and others would put that number closer to 1.5 million. And some indigenous peoples uh, make convincing arguments that there was several millions of people living in the Canadian territories at that point. Evidence indicates, and we could talk about it, and if people want to talk about it, I'm very willing to, that these were productive, growing societies with trade routes, navies, there was some slavery, languages were well developed. In short, they were rich societies, but they were in different and diverse levels of development, depending on what the lands they lived on demanded of them. So in my home area, uh, people were more nomadic, and they followed buffalo, and they, did, they worked in different kinds of ways. The, the coastal uh, First Nations, Salish, Haida, and others, they had fixed navies. Uh, they used to go down uh, along the uh, uh, route down to uh, California and take slaves, bring people back. They had very complicated societies and different kinds of educational and other kinds of, uh, of uh, fixed settlements. So sophisticated, diverse societies. The interesting thing, though, is by 1901, when the first census was done that included indigenous peoples, the population uh, was under 130,000. So if you took the most conservative elements or, the, or the, uh, what I would consider to be a much more accurate ones, the death rate of indigenous peoples was between 80 and 98%. What happened? Well, disease, smallpox, influenza, bubonic plague, pneumatic plagues were devastating to the local populations because they had no immunities to these European diseases. But what's really incredibly important for us to understand is that we have uncovered very clearly that some of this transmission of disease was intentional. Some of it was unintentional. And some of it was the result, the death was the result of withholding treatments when we had, when the colonial powers had treatments for people. Regardless of the proportions of that, all of that kind of health problem was the uh, impact of newcomers. Newcomers brought those diseases with them. In a brilliant book by James Daschuk called Clearing the Plains, James carefully documents how old world diseases became ep epidemics. And for the prairies, this was uh, magnified by the death of 90% 90, 90 of the uh, buffalo. The mass, this is uh, buffalo skulls, by the way. Um, Europeans came onto the prairies and literally uh, slaughtered uh, almost all of the buffalo because if you remember, there was the Industrial Revolution going on. And buffalo skins were perfect for the belts in the factories. And so they took the skins, left the rest of it to rot, and indeed caused mass starvation in the uh, 19th century. Uh, it was a severe cold snap, as is quite common in Saskatchewan. I can tell you as a kid who had to walk through snow that deep, right up to here, right? Um, Backwards, that's right, with no shoes. No, it was terrible. No, but there, there was a, a real cold snap as well that co coincided with this. And this meant the 
uh, almost the end of uh, many nations. And there's a brilliant story that I'd suggest you take a look at of a hero of mine, a um, fellow named Poundmaker. And he uh, was very, very instrumental in helping uh, some of the government uh, people to try and uh, bridge the gap culturally and others. And then when his village, uh, when his home community was in mass starvation, he marched them to the fort to where he had been helpful and they wouldn't even let them in and they all died at the uh, uh, gates of the fort. And so it's a really uh, a, a heart wrenching but important story of how people interacted uh, in this period. Secondly, we, saw, we see something uh, uh, called uh, environmental dispossession and pushing people out of their traditional territories, dispossessing people of their lands and traditional foods and activities. This led to starvation and a myriad of other problems. I documented two what were called by the government in the 1950s uh, relocations. This was in the 1950s. Uh, you, may you may recall a place called uh, Davis Inlet where there was um, uh, massive uh, youth suicides, gas sniffing, um, a high degree of uh, alcohol um, addictions. This was a community, when we looked into this whole thing, they were moved, they were hunters. They had a hunting, uh, uh, they gathered food through hunting, they taught their children how to take care of the land and through ceremonies that had to do with hunting. And then the government decided they didn't like them where they were, so they moved the whole community to a fishing area where there was no animals to hunt and said, well, you can learn to fish. Well, the problem is, is that when all your ceremonies and all your teachings and all the way that you're uh, uh, training kids how to behave and work together and everything is based on what you did before and how you organized your community, you can't relocate people. But what we've seen is that um, there's, a, there's uh, a lot of these relocations. There was also, of course, across the uh, 19th century and even into the 20th century, the reduction of lands, uh, squeezing people into smaller and smaller parcels. And these are a whole story that we can talk about a little bit more. OK. so. I moved the picture of the kids from Oneida over a little bit to show what happened after 1901. And some people look at that and they say, that's amazing, look, everything's fine now, there's lots of people, the fertility rates are through the roof, there's lots of kids in the families. But sociologists, of course, will tell you, <coughs> and I'm not gonna bore you with the science of it, but this is called response fertility and demographic um, transition theory. And basically, what this shows us is exactly the same thing that happened before. That it's a human response to being insecure. It's a human response to having lost so many children in the past and losing so many uh, uh, community members. If populations feel secure, like most non-Indigenous Canadians do, uh, that most of our children are going to make it and take care of us, and for parents, I know, you'll have to take that with a grain of salt that our children will actually take care of us. Maybe that will happen someday. But um, we, our response is to reduce the size of our families, reduce our fertility rates, and uh, concentrate more on acquiring wealth and a higher standard of living. So this high fertility is really part and parcel of what happened in the past and a response to it. I want to talk a little bit about residential schools because we've talked about population. We saw what happened to the populations. And that the second thing I'd like to discuss is uh, residential schools. So beginning in about the 19th century uh, and as early as 1840, but in earnest after the Indian Act of 1876 was passed, the policy was to remove children from the influence of their families and culture and assimilate them into uh, European cultures. This was a disaster, unmitigated disaster. Uh, 
taking the child, the Indian out of the child was the, uh, was the motto. This was funded by the Canadian government, and of course you had a chance to see Carrie's work upstairs. Funded by the Canadian government and administered mainly by Christian churches, predominantly Roman Catholic, 60% of the schools, Anglican Church of Canada, 30%, and United Church, about 10%. Kids forcefully were, <coughs> were forcefully removed from their parents. And the thinking of this is really important. I've spent a lot of time with people from the Rec uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, research studies, is that there was something wrong with being indigenous. There was something wrong with the, uh, uh, the cultures, the languages, the way things. And the only way forward was to eliminate as a people and bring in you know, full uh, assimilation. So kids forcefully moved, in some cases thrown into carts or later thrown into trucks and driven, uh, driven away. What we know is that thousands of children died in the schools uh, or trying to escape from the schools. Um, and as uh, one uh, person, uh, uh, Kerry asked the question, I think, when, uh, in his video. He said, how many schools that we went to as a, a people of European background uh, or a, a non-Indigenous background, how many of our schools had uh, um, cemeteries? I don't remember any. But residential schools all had cemeteries. So what we know now is that the Canadian government broke down families broke down the teaching and learning, the transfer of skills, the transfer of ceremonies and languages and things that embody uh, uh, what it means to be uh, First Nations. They broke down those transmissions and caused what we call, sociologists call, intergenerational trauma. Now, this completely crazy plan was based on the idea that ripping children from their families, boarding them and forcing a change would be helpful. The outcome was intergenerational schisms, breakages, social disruption, death, abuse, and I can discuss this if you want, but not only were the people who went to the schools themselves affected, but also the children of those people and the children, children of those people. The separation from grandma, auntie, mom, dad meant that people didn't get to learn how to parent. They didn't get to learn how to be part of their community. And in turn, that is passed intergenerationally to the next generation, and we see things reproduced in that sense. Sorry, you'd, yeah. I was just going to say that um, a lot of my elders taught me a little bit different story about the objectives of these schools. At, during that time, it seemed like it was um, amongst uh, the Euro Europeans of that day and the indigenous people, they thought they were helping. They thought, well, we're just going to take these pagans and we're going to give them, you know, give them God, we're going to give them a civilization, we're going to give them civilized life. But the original architects of, of this whole exterm cultural extermination, there was an underlying issue. And it wasn't to assimilate, it was to take away. Because a child who no longer has a connection to their grandparents, who no longer remembers playing by that tree or that lake or that river or remembers the signing of the treaty that took place over there, then they no longer have a connection to it. That was the underlying objective, and it was a land grab. And that's what my elders taught me. It's, I would certainly agree that that was the outcome, whether there was a, a difference, whether we had people who were, in a, uh, in a sense, had made that decision. I think that it's quite clear that some of our prime ministers of that day talked about this in exactly those terms, saying that this is how we can be able to push our railway forward, and this is the only way we're going to be able to do it. And I think some actually believed that they were going to create something a little bit better because they didn't believe that indigenous cultures and languages were worthy of being um, protected and developed. Both are racialist, both are colonial, both of those things ended up in exactly the same, uh, same situation. So I don't disagree with you. And I think when we talk about truth and reconciliation, uh, 
Truth is understanding what was done, and reconciliation is doing something about it, trying to make a change to right some of those things that are wrong. Sorry, Sorry Jerry, I just, wanted, no, no, no. I just also wanted to take care. The evidence, uh, what I'm saying, is also evident in uh, the Supreme Court's decision If you look at you know, Ottawa, you see center building, center block, and you have East Block and West Block. East Block at one point, in Iron Street, was entirely Indian affairs and other development Canada. Well, what was the primary purpose of the majority of workers there? Land surveyors and administrators. Their job was to take the land, administer it, cut it up, sur survey it, and start selling it, and passing it to the provinces, what we call our own land. So all this stuff is evidenced by, by what's taking, what's actually taking. But we're using this notion that, that there was this racial divide or this un racial under uh, racist kind of understanding that we needed to help these. That was the that was the story that we needed to tell everybody. But I believe, and it's my assertion, that the true the true true objective of all of that and the people who pioneered this and architected this that, that, that it was to have access to the resources and to the land. And that was the way to do it. Yeah, and I don't disagree. There's certainly evidence of th that, that, that many of the leaders in that period of time and what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has found is letters between people that made exactly those kinds of arguments, so it's quite true. It's, the interesting thing is, is we, if we look back at some of the people who administered the, uh, the schools, it gets to be very complicated because some of the churches were arguing something somewhat different and weren't benefiting as much in terms of the land grab. So it becomes, um, a di a, it's difficult to make a single argument, I guess is what I would say. Sure. Um, the last point, which is it really, and I think it's really important to understand, I loved uh, love, that's the wrong word, but I think it's so interesting to see that picture from the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of the little kids' handcuffs. And it's incredible to think that uh, kids were handcuffed in these schools. So the last argument, which uh, Luke segued for me perfectly, thank you very much, is about land. And What we argue is that enviro environmental dispossession is a fancy word, but essentially that in a political sense or uh, in a political way, land was taken from people through the school's process. Some conscious, as we've been talking about, some in terms of the outcomes that, uh, that were created. And so, and on the other, there's physical forms of which land were taken away clear-cutting forests, pollutions, and other kinds of environmental destructions, taking over lands and saying, it's an interesting thing in Canada, and it's very unusual. I mean, in Canada, um, people didn't used to have rights to anything more than the first inch that they could stand on. Anything more than an inch below the surface was government-controlled. And so all minerals and other kinds of, uh, of valuables, people could come in and uh, mine those. Uh, even if it was land that was ceded to indigenous peoples. So we call that, uh, that kind of uh, a process environmental dispossession. And it indeed, I think it may be hard to understand, but the environment or lands that people live in dictate how they relate to nature, how they teach, what the ceremonies are. And by breaking the tie to the land, you're also breaking up the culture and breaking up the community. So the residential schools are busy breaking the ties between grandparents, aunties, uncles, moms, dads, and kids. And you have also a process of de-landing or dispossessing people from their traditional territories. Okay. So, come back to that question. I don't know, somebody said no, it wasn't good. Well. Obviously, I've taken you on a little tour de force. And of course, I think what's really important here is that um, uh, indigenous people will often argue with me and say, that's not even the right question. Um, but it's clear that the population record shows that it wasn't at all 
there was no, nothing really positive about Europeans coming here. The dispossession, and um, there's a whole series of things that we've looked at, I think, that really show us um, uh, that this was a very difficult and horrible kind of a, of, a, of a process to walk through. I don't like talking about the negative, but I think it is important to understand that there's very real things. I, um, by negative, I don't mean I, I don't like concentrating on saying people have these problems, people have these problems, people have these problems. But there's some really important things that we have to understand. Life ex expectancy as a result of this history is much lower for indigenous peoples. Chronic disease, infectious disease, incarceration rates, family breakups, suicides, even missing and murdered indigenous women. All these things are outcomes of this history that we've just been talking about. The point here is that there's a pattern of structural inequality and lower measures of well-being. And I can tell you as former chair of the Health Professions Regulatory Council of this province, um, as a researcher and as a sociologist, this is not the fault of the people themselves. This world was created for our neighbors. And it leads me to a question that's much more positive. What can be done? And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to summarize. What, we've, what we did about 15 years ago is we started a concerted effort to work together, indigenous communities, indigenous policymakers, indigenous researchers, and European background, uh, Western uh, policymakers and, pol and, uh, and researchers, to try and understand what to do. We had conferences. The uh, largest one was 1,600, where it was, uh, there was 500 indigenous peoples from all across the country came, and we talked. And we began to do, I think, what Luke was talking about, break bread to talk about honestly with each other what has happened and where do we want to go. And one of the things that we found was that um, instead of concentrating on what's gone wrong and finding out that, oh, 50% 50, 50 of these communities have this issue and this, that are all negative, what we came to the realization is let's take a look at where things are being developed well, where things are going well. What are the kinds of patterns and types of, uh, of findings that will actually um, could, be, uh, could be looked at as, as best practices? And we also found that um, school education is really critical. Getting kids through high school is a particularly critical issue. Only 50% of First Nations kids finish high school at this point. But of the 50% that do finish high school, a very high proportion, in fact, uh, in, several, in several of the census, a higher proportion of those kids go to university than non-Indigenous. So it's a really positive, uh, positive thing. But how are we going to do that? We need curriculum that, re uh, that reflects the lives of First Nations students. We need better funding on reserves or in reserve communities for the schools and educational activities that are taking place there. Um, we need a reason to go to school. Education, sometimes we think about as something that's sort of an end in itself, something that's good to have. But really, education is just a process that leads us from where we come in the door to takes us through the school and through the learning and out into doing something. So we have to work with the communities to help them carry out the kinds of developments and things that they believe are positive. We also found something that's really fairly straightforward, and we could have found this out from asking probably any elder in any community, but the point is that the more sovereignty, the more control a people has over their own conditions, their own lives, their own communities, the better off those communities are. It's a simple thing. The problem, of course, is resourcing the startup. <laughs> 
and making sure that communities have the kinds of resources and capacities that they need. So if we ask the question, what do Aboriginal people want, someone like Tom King says uh, in The in Inconvenient Indian, and he'll say it in person uh, forcefully too, what to, to ask what do Indians want is the wrong question, he says, because there's no single native people, there's no single Indians, that is. There are Mohawks at the Six Nations, there's Salish of BC, Bloods of Southern Ontario. Each culture, language group has unique histories, backgrounds, and needs. But there are some uh, commonalities. And I think that one of the things that we see is moving forward, part of reconciliation is going to mean uh, uh, helping develop and allowing and making sure that we nurture more so uh, sovereignty by First Nations of, of their territories and um, their developments. The Indian Act and the treaties are going to have to be replaced. There's no doubt. The Indian Act, there's no small wonder that uh, Carrie Newman put the Indian Act and its changes as the fringe on the blanket, because the Indian Act in itself is one of the most destructive pieces of legislation. But you can't just take it and throw it out the window, as Trudeau wanted to do, uh, the father Trudeau wanted to do in it with the white paper, because it has to be replaced with something. And that means with sovereignty, with control, with the capacity to actually take care of one's affairs. Resource development and identity issues would be part of that sovereignty. And a recognition of the problems created by our policies and in informing Canadians, and I'm talking about non-Indigenous Canadians, through our school system. There's still a dreadful lack in our school system of any kind of educational processes that teach about the past. And lastly, what I've said, and I've just cherry-picked through these things that we've done over the years, is that we have to understand that there's different ways of understanding. Western science and Western ways of knowing are just one way of knowing. There are indigenous ways of knowing. And we have to accept that. And we don't, in doing that, we don't have to say, which we do now, <coughs> show me why you're right. It's to accept that these, some of these, teaching, these teachings are reasonable and important. Can we achieve? There's a lot of talented people in the system, and talented people all over, running uh, corporations, running businesses, running communities, building things, teaching. Um, and I think that that kind of growth is what we have to do is create the conditions where those kinds of leaders can lead. And I believe that there's a bright future only if we understand the past truth and work to reconcile by supporting the growth and empowerment of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples that share the land. The price of not working together is going to be deeper and deeper uh, problems for the country, both physically, socially. It's going to make for incredible problems for the peoples that uh, are subject to some of the uh, uh, historical processes. And it's just not something that I would like to envisage. It's something that we have to uh, work together to try and eliminate. The price is just too high. So as I say, leaders of uh, today are coming forward. I mean, these are just a collection of some friends of mine that uh, are amazing in, in terms of the work that they do. But it's creating a world here where they can prosper and help to build a better country. I'm going to stop there. And the, one of the things, I just love babies. Um, <laughs> it's just one of the things. And uh, I have a lot of friends. They all bring their babies up. And I used to have a staff that used to say, there's more of your friends with babies here, Jerry. And they would look at me a little funny. But <laughs> believe me. Just friends, and I'd like to say thank you very much for being so patient with me thus far. Okay, so at this time, um, thank you so much uh, for that inf uh, that informative presentation. We much appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have a we're going to have a Q and A. So, are there any questions uh, for Jerry?
And could I save that order? The questions could come to you too. Oh, yes, yes. I don't know how much I'd be able to, uh, you know, <laughs> impress upon anyone, but certainly, uh, are there any questions? Um, yes. Over oh. oh, sorry. Um, so the question was, one of the, the big issues is the land loss, right? And that the, the reserves are small and not adequate for the people that are on them. How, how do we fix that? Well, um, you know, that's a, that's a big question. I don't know if there's any one way to look at it, uh, but I can say that it, from my perspective, it's about justice and, uh, and it's about environmental justice. Uh, the reality of our situation is that for the first time in the history of mankind, we face a very uncertain future, both uh, economically, physically, environmentally, uh, things that we need to be concerned with. Uh, a very large population of biologists believe that uh, if you were to put the history of mankind in a 12-hour clock, that we're not only in the 11th hour, we're in the 59th minute and the 59th second of that clock. That there, that uh, uh, our American uh, generals are, are saying that uh, climate change is, of the, uh, is the number one security threat uh, in the world. So these are things that I, I think that are not just issues of who has the right over the land. It's about are we going to protect it for future use? Are we going to ensure that your that future generations on all sides have a planet to live on, drink clean water to drink from, um, you know, to, uh, uh, fertile soil to grow grow food on? Uh, so these are to me, the issues of our day. And if you look at traditional uh, traditional times, the native people, they never really believed in ownership in that way. They never, you know, we, how could you own your mother? How could you own your uncles, the trees? the grandmother moon. You can't own these things. And so we're going to have to change the way that we believe about what justice means, about what ownership means, about our future, about how we think about the future. And that's one thing that I, I kind of think we need to start looking at together in terms of reconciling some of those differences. Thank you. And Jerry? Yeah, um, I agree with uh, I agree with Luke on that in a practical policy sense. Though um, I did a study, which I can't talk about, but I will talk about uh, of um, uh, specific claims and land claims. And uh, some 12, 14 years ago, there was 750 billion dollars worth of unsettled land claims. And the decision that the government made at that point, and it's even more now. <coughs> The decision the government made at that point was that the quicker they settled these claims, even the just ones, the more each settled claim generated two or three more. So they slowed down. The Justice Department slowed that process painfully down. So something we can do is to call to account and say, where are we going with this? Uh, let's have a reckoning. Where's the Auditor General looking at specific claims and, and how they're being handled? Th these are things that could unlock some resources for communities and would allow them to take some. So it's not an answer. It's just there's millions of these pieces. I think the other piece to that is that when you look at a lot of these modern land claims that are there, uh, there's a number of provisions within those land claims that involve just the transfer of cash and no return of land. And so this this is obviously a big problem for our people, but for many people who are struggling financially already, uh, who don't have access to clean water, who don't have access to healthcare systems, to education systems, $150 million looks pretty good uh, when you don't have much. And, and $150 million is probably a, a drop in a bucket of what this claim actually might be worth. A perfect example, City of Toronto, the Chippewas of Mississauga. I think it was a billion dollars uh, or more they were saying in terms of land claim and uh, I think they settled for a hundred million dollars. <laughs>
with no claim. And, and, and another special proviso within those agreements is that they surrender the land, that they no longer have any interest now and into the future. So. It would be easy would do if they said, no, no, I don't want the money, give me the land back, right? Yeah, precisely, precisely. But there's no, there's no um, option on the government side for that to happen. I mean, unless, well, I guess there's one case, uh, Ipawash, which you're probably all aware of, uh, that uh, what happened there is that uh, the people were moved from Stony Point to Kettle Point, their sister community in the 1930s, uh, to accommodate a military base uh, during World War II. And they were promised that the land would come back right after the war was over. Well, that didn't happen. Speed up to, was it 1996? And there was the standoff uh, down at Ipperwash Park, and, the, and then and it resulted in Dudley George being shot and killed by the Ontario Provincial Police. Big inquiry. Anyway, the short end of it all is that they're, they've now negotiated a settlement in which there is a cash a settlement, but also a land settlement. So they're going to actually get the land back. But that's a very rare circumstance. Most land claims aren't settled that way. There are quite a few. Uh, uh, there's quite a few now that uh, uh, people going to the table and they're demanding to move in that direction. BC has been kind of a leader in this, uh, uh, particularly around Vancouver, where they've done substitute land deals where they've said, yeah, well, your, our ferry terminal is on your land, but how about we give you the next block over, you know, those kinds of things. And so, they, and I think the point here, though, is that, you know, the kind of monkey business that went on where, like, on the flood, flood <coughs> people in Alberta, where they <coughs> went around the negotiators and went and, and offered everybody a new truck. They just like, went from door to door and said, you can have a new truck. And people went, a new truck. And that, they just they completely sidewalks the deal. I think those things we have to watch out for, and, and these spokesmen, uh, that we just don't like the country that's being run like that, you know? It's part of parcel. I'm sure this is a basic question, but I don't know the answer. Um, that is uh, what I know in the past in the Indian Act, the um, indigenous people did not own the land of the reserves. What's the current status of that now? Do they own the land? <laughs> well, Oneida is a pretty unique community in that we purchased the land uh, prior to Confederation. Uh, we were exiled from New York State by the uh, New York State government and the American government around 1830. And uh, we started looking for land. It was We were basically told, you either leave or we're going to do what we did to you way back during some former battle in which they killed Oneida babies. So the United said, well, we're out of here. So they sold whatever land they could. Uh, they raised about 5000 thousand um, pounds of uh, sterling silver and they brought it here and they met with uh, superintendent for Indian Affairs at the time um, superintendent Jarvis and they negotiated land uh, up beside the Chippewa so right outside London here there's Oneida Chippewa and Muncie so they negotiated the purchase of that land so now if you ask an Oneida today they said well we purchased that land straight out it doesn't belong to Canada it's ours we're to be left alone unmolested the uh, Privy Council passed an order in 1840 saying that we are that we are to be left alone. And so it all de depends on matter perspective. Now, Indian res the Indian reservation system is still intact. Uh, what it means is that the through, through the Indian Act, uh, is that through legislation that the government of Canada holds the land uh, for the purpose of, of, of uh, helping the indigenous population uh, by giving them these parcels of land to live on and that they should never be molested or hurt or taken advantage of. Really, that was part of a larger piece of legislation known as the British North American Act. And the British North American Act came into being as a result of people trying to uh, swindle land. Uh, the newcomers were coming and swindling land from indigenous people, selling it for, for you know, they were, they were, they didn't even really know what kind of agreements they were entering into. Um, and then what happened is that the governments and, 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 the, and, and the lords and, and all the way back to the monarchy said, hey, you know, this is, this is we, we have a claim on this and nobody can, nobody can buy, sell, or trade land without the permission of us. And so that was where you start to see that assertion uh, when, with, of the Indian Act. And that's very much why it's alive today, is because it controls Indian resources. Any Indian resources that come from uh, come from that come from the said lands is subject to be held by the by the crown. So it all gets transferred to the crown. 
and and they have whatever power because essentially what the law did was make Indians wards similar to how a child becomes a ward of a state. So it made all First Nations people wards of the state and it took control over their lands, their resources, and anything that they could have access to. Oneida, a very good example, in uh, 18, uh, around 1860, 1870, uh, and even into the early 1900s, we were very prosperous. We were good farmers, we were cultivating. Uh, we were actually, uh, my grandmother tells stories about how my grandfather, her grandfather, you, uh, during the uh, depression, used to um, feed local people, even non-natives, because everybody was so poor that they, he, you know, they had compassion. And so from his farm, he fed all of the local people. And, uh, and what they did is the government came in, they saw how wealthy the Oneidas were living off the land and working the land, that they had all of their cattle deemed uh, contaminated and killed them all and knocked them back into poverty. So, I mean, like, this thing known as Indian Act has had a fair amount of control over Indian lands and resources for many, many years. So reserves, and to answer to your question, is, is that they're still in existence. The government still has um, the authority to determine how the lands are distributed, how a reserve, uh, um, uh, if a community should decide to purchase more land and expand their community. They have still signing, uh, uh, final signing authority on all those. You've seen the English kind of approach in the British Columbia, the and others that have shifted that whole model. And Northwest Territories, for example, as, as well, what they've done is that they've put in place, uh, there's a, like the Oil um, and Development Act. You can opt out, as a First Nation, you can opt out of the Indian Act, and uh, it's, I know it's quite technical, but, and you can move over to that, and it gives you control <coughs> of oil, gas, and development, and you don't lose the collective of your land and it actually transfers with that. But we have to put some of those new things into place. We have to be willing to so that we can start moving away piece by piece from the Indian land. Because it really is a colonial piece that was developed to take control. And, but people don't want to give it up without some guarantees of what's going to replace it. Because there's some protections in it. And that's always the game that's played. You can't get rid of it because it protects its own way, but it actually is the core of a colonial relationship that's taking away rights and taking away the capacity. So it's like a catch-22, and it keeps operating. They're very, it's something that you really have to pay attention to and dig a little deeper at, because there's these agreements happening all over the country that you're not even quite sure what's happening. Um, and they're making it with the First Nations. So they're saying, well, well, we'll negotiate this with you and we'll give you some royalties as part of this resource development. But if we sign off on this agreement with you, it also means that you have to sign off on your uh, possession. Uh, uh, you also have to surrender the land. So saying, well, wait a minute, if we own the land and you're willing to give us a royalty from the land, but we have to give up the land? Like these are these are these outrageous agreements that are taking place across the country. The contract of law is how Canada is constituted. It's constituted on this basis that we all agree that the law is going to be followed. The government of Canada and its provinces have not followed that law when it comes to Indian lands and territories and resources. That's what land claims are about. Is that they're saying we entered into an agreement with you. You didn't fulfill or uh, your end of the bargain. Therefore, everything is null and void and everything that could have happened as part of that and the terms of those, of those contracts are no longer applicable. I want my land back. The government say, oh, wait now. And so these are going now to Supreme Courts. They're being heard by su Supreme Court justices and they're being heard and they're being acknowledged and they're being listened to because Canada is in violation of breaking those laws, breaking those agreements. British Columbia is a very perfect example. They had zero treaties there. They have not lost a war. It was not ceded. Their land is not, has not been ceded, and they have not surrendered their land. So they haven't given it up, they haven't lost it in a war, and they haven't given it to anybody. And yet the government still is trying to control the, the pieces on that end. And what they're doing is throwing what is seemingly a drop in a bucket of the resources that those communities possibly could have. If you ask the NISCA today, if they liked the agreement that they signed, they would have a different opinion than when they signed it. Because there isn't one drop of money that was promised to them that's going to them now. 
they're just like an Indian Act government who gets transfers here and there, but they're not getting the same amount of money that they they weren't getting the money that they were promised. And I should have as well, um, just to illustrate some of the complexity, uh, we've been working with a lot of First Nations, Mike, uh, you know that. And it, 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 just want to give you one story. We worked with a, a whole series of First Nations on impact benefit agreements. These are agreements that people sign with resource companies or with governments, you know, when somebody wants something that's on their land. But if, when we look at the impact benefit agreements, some of them will say, oh, so many jobs will be given to First Nations from the communities, so much of this, so much of that. But then there's no, the jobs that are created, there's no training program to get people ready for the jobs. So they open it up and they'll say, we're, all, we're ready for you to apply. People come and apply to, for the work. And then they say, well, you're not qualified. There's no one qualified. So they bring people from the South to do it. The, that's what I mean, the, the whole regime of development has to be scrutinized and, and, um, and worked with because even in the subtleties, people are losing out. They're losing out uh, big time. Well, it's, it's, it's like uh, if, you, if you owned um, 40 acres of land, pristine, beautiful land just outside of London, hilly, good for a golf course. A guy comes to you, a, a, a guy comes to you and says, well, I'm gonna build a golf course on your land and you can work in the golf shop. Aren't you happy? Aren't you happy with that deal? That's exactly the deals that the First Nations are getting and they're ridiculous. And they're going on today. Any other questions? Yes. I would just be curious to hear um, some of your thoughts and reflections on the uh, unsettle 150 discourse movement, like the conversation around uh, the, the 150 from that perspective and lens. Did you want to? Yeah, like there's the, like the unsettle 150 movement that's that's getting some more traction and and I'm just curious what if, if you had any thoughts about that. What I what I would say is that I have I in my lifetime I have never seen better conditions for us to move forward. That's my own personal view. I think that the dialogues that are going on, the kinds of um, uh, willingness to change in major organizations is greater than I've seen before. That's just an openness. That I'm not talking about movement and actual change. I'm just saying the conditions are there. Um, I'm chair of the 150 committee for Western, for example, and the only reason I accepted to do that was if the university was going to uh, fast track its indigenous strategic plan and do a whole series of other things. I said, I, I was part of the committee that developed that plan and I said, I don't want any more stalling. If you want to move, let's make this the year that we do that. And we did pass that in Board of Governors and the Senate and, and it's being implemented. Those kinds of things I see as, uh, as illustrative of what can happen in a lot of organizations. At the same time, I see a lot of foot dragging on expensive <coughs> money-based things in, at the, on the government side. I mean, it's a complicated, a complicated time. I mean, the, the debate that's going on right now, for example, over the giving of so-called awarding of the uh, US um, embassy building as an indigenous space in Ottawa, I don't know if you're following this debate, but it's a, this is a very heated debate and it's a very important debate because it's, that's a colonial representation. And uh, as Doug Cardinal said the, uh, yesterday, I think he said, the, the place is a junk hole. It's just, it has, it has no cultural meaning to anybody. And why would you give something that's so worthless and say that this is a great step forward? So there's all sorts of stuff, but the fact that that debate is even being had about creating spaces and, and trying to do it is a, is a very positive opening that we wouldn't have seen 20 years ago. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think that it's not, I, I know that it raises a very a big question for, uh, for Canadians 
you know, how do I celebrate? How do I celebrate, you know, the, the 150th of my country? Um, and there's lots to be proud of. I mean, but there's also, I think it's about acknowledging, recognizing how can you be a part of, um, be a part of the solution. And that is, involves doing what I guess we both have been talking about, which is uh, finding ways to participate, recognize, learn, uh T tell your friends about it, uh, that yes, it's great, Canada is wonderful, and, and you know, there's many things to celebrate about Canada, but there is a part of Canada that, that we need to talk about also, and it's that, it's that, you know, it's old uncle whoever living in the back room there that, you know, maybe we're not so happy about telling our friends about, but eventually he has to come out of the room, and eventually we got to talk about him. So, I mean, like, to me, those are the things that, that we can do individually, but I mean, it's going to be a, like, and that's what he talked about, that's what Jerry talked about earlier, is that, you know, having, you know, for us, celebrating 150 years is different, you know, it's, it's for us as, like, I'm a Haudenosaunee uh, person, and it's been 500 years of persecution. Uh, of, of dispossession of, you know, and even, even with all these positive, wonderful uh, things that s are seemingly happening, we're cautious about it because there was a lot of really wonderful handshaking that took place in 1901. There was a lot of handshaking that took place at the signing of the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1796, which is now no longer uh, uh, being honored. There was a lot of, we're going to help you and we're all going to do this, you know, we're going to be in this together and we're going to, you know, be comrades and, and, and work together um, over all the centuries. So you'll have to excuse that sometimes our people, we don't trust when we hear that. So that's where I think what what's different about this time that I'm more optimistic about is that people like you are coming out that aren't necessarily Indigenous, who have an Indigenous background, but you're coming out and saying, I want to learn more. I want to understand more. If we leave it into the government's hand, we're going to have more of that. If we bring it back to the people, that's when we're going to see significant change. Okay, if I may, I'd like to go right back to one of the comments you made right at the very beginning about a more effective understanding coming through breaking bread together. Uh, if we wish to do that, what specific steps would you recommend to us to make that happen? Uh, every once, uh, I think it's once a month, maybe twice a month, at Nameron Friendship Center located at 260 Colburn Street, they have what they call Soup Kitchen, uh, in which uh, I think it's on a Wednesday at about 6 o'clock. There's a lot of families that come out. They have a social afterwards. Uh, great opportunity to connect with uh, some of the local community. Uh, and then there are other events as well that take place in this area. Um, so there's ceremonies that take place, uh, but more like powwows, uh, festivals, there's, if you keep your ear to the ground and you do, and, and go over to Nameron Friendship Center, they have a lot of information about uh, different community activities. But every, I think it's uh, uh, every two Wednesdays, every second Wednesday, there is a, uh, what they call a soup kitchen, and they, it's free, you go, there's First Nations people there, they have a social afterwards, and you literally get to break bread. Each September, um, the Museum of Archaeology, uh, of Ontario Archaeology, has a uh, major powwow with drummers, dancers, and communities all participate. It's a great chance to meet people, and uh, and people are really friendly when it, it's a great celebration time. So it's a great time to meet, right? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And back. Um, as we're moving seemingly towards a, um, an economy that's built on knowledge, um, can you speak about is is there an um, is there a line to be drawn between dispossession of land and cultural appropriation and the debates that have been existing sort of or the debates that have been sort of flying about that of late? Um, yes, I think. I, I think that people are saying, and, and, and I began my talk by saying I, I don't speak for anybody but me, so I'm just telling you my understanding. Um, the argument basically in the Writers' Union and others was, uh, you know, you have one group saying you have a responsibility to try and live in somebody else's shoes and understand them and try and talk about their lives and, and, and get closer that way. And on the other side, the argument was cultural appropriation is really uh, an important attack 
taking away and assuming that you can talk about people's cultures and understandings. And the history of cultural appropriation has been disgusting, right? In terms of books and, and uh, movies and stereotypic developments. So in that sense then, even that debate is a good thing that we're learning about how people understand it and where we are and what people are thinking about it. In school, uh, in university, for example, what I know about is that as we're trying to introduce new curricula into the, um, uh, into the school, we're really making sure that we spend time finding indigenous voices and indigenous peoples, scholars, researchers, elders, it, it, to create that curricula, not have Jerry White, with his understanding, talk about th those things, you see? So the movement, uh, when you think about the link to the knowledge-based economy, we're now in a position where we can consult and can work with lots of people without having to create a single space for them all to sit in, right? We can do that in different ways. And so that's really important in order of pushing that forward. So yes, there's some negative debates. It's good to have those debates and bring them out onto the table. And yes, I think we're learning how to do some of these things in terms of, of, uh, of changing understandings. I think we're going to experience a great change uh, in our economy because uh, now, I mean, there are there's enough legal precedent that's being set uh, that Indigenous people not only have to be consulted but they have to be accommodated uh, when you're uh, when when um, uh, doing any kind of developmental work in their in traditional territories, and I think also uh, that with a lot of um, I think that we also have to uh, understand that uh, that we are going to be a part of the future, whether it is going to be in a good way or in a not so good way. I think there's going to be a greater demand that justice be had, uh, because First Nations people are finding their voice, they're finding their feet, they're saying, "Hey, now we're no longer in this cyclical cycle uh, where 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 it's hurting, where we're hurting, we're in struggling, we're in pain, but now we're we're finding out who we are and where we come from." And so there is, if you, if for me, I see on, on, on Oneida, uh, in say 1970, there was probably 30 people carrying ceremonies on and most of them were old elders. Today, there's over 300 people in our longhouse and most of them are children, young people, young adults who are trying to figure out who they are and where they come from. So there is going to be a great demand for, um, you know, as we move forward in our shared, in our shared future, what kind of future are we going to have? Is it going to be one of reconciliation, or is it going to be one where we've continued to be to be at odds with one another? And until now, governments have been able to stop or to be able to quell the First Nations rising, uh, but but they can't anymore. There's too many young people. The, I think in the next 10 years, StatsCan says that one in 10 adolescents in in Canada are going to be of Indigenous um, descent. So. I think we need, it's something that we need to pay attention to. If we expect, I mean, right now, First Nations alone contribute about uh, $11 billion to uh, the gross domestic product. And we are, and, and the misnomer that we don't pay taxes, I mean, two thirds of our population live off reserve and they're, they're not sheltered by the same tax exemption laws. So they're paying taxes. So there's all these things that are going out there, and we're one of the fastest growing financial. We're we're part of the fastest growing financial sectors. Uh, we're we're you know we're banking a lot more. We have oil and gas. We're uh, trading, um, and we're a big part of the Canadian economy. So you know I think that we it, it's we the question is we have a shared future. What is that future going to look like, and how are we as individuals going to contribute uh, to whether or not it's going to be reconciliation or a hostile future? And I'm for reconciliation. Are there any other questions? Well, um, I think that concludes our question and answer period. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jerry White for coming and offering um, some of his many, many years of work and, uh, and knowledge and insight. And it really is a pleasure to hear from you uh, and the work that you've, uh, that you've put together over all these years and working with countless folks. And this has been an area that, uh, that uh, not too many white men are allowed to go, but you went, and it's great. <laughs>
Uh, but we're very thankful for the work uh, that Jerry has, has and continues to contribute at our local uh, Center for Higher Learning at the University uh, University of Western Ontario. And thank you all for coming. It takes, uh, it takes great patience and care, and we're so thankful. And please tell your friends about it. We have another session coming up again, I believe, on... Uh, on next Thursday. Uh, so um, please come back, bring your friends, and uh, we really appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you so much.